Okay. There is a thought. There are lots of different cultures. The culture is a whole way of living, a whole way of thinking, a whole way of seeing the world, values, and beliefs about uh, the origin of the world and the nature of the human being and what we can expect in the future. And they're different. A person grows up in a culture. That culture forms his mind, forms his sensibility, sensitivity, perceptions, his understanding. Each person sees the world through the lens of his own culture. That means that people don't really understand one another. People can't really communicate. People may even use the same word, but use a different meaning. Translation from one language to another language, when they come from different cultures, is going to be very problematic, only very approximate, and it's going to give rise to all sorts of misunderstanding. And here, I think, is the bottom line idea. And there's nothing to say that one culture is better than another culture, more valid, more true, more uh, realistic, more uh, valuable. Cultures can't be judged one against another. They have to be treated as equal. Let me put this into a reasonably precise argument. Point number one, there's no way to evaluate cultures one against another because where are the values going to come from that you use to evaluate the different cultures? They're going to come from your culture because that's what you know. That's where you were brought up. That's what you've been taught. So that means you're going to use your values from your culture to evaluate, let's say, your culture and another culture. But applying your values from your culture to another culture is apples and oranges. Your values reflect your culture. That's a different culture. It's a different way of living in the world altogether. So it's impossible to compare the value of two different cultures. So it's impossible to compare. Values have to be treated equally. And that's why people of this stripe preach that every, value has e every culture has equal value, equal importance, equal significance. That's what they are, and that's how they should be treated. That's the position. OK, well, before we get to important, deep questions, let's just point out that the way I've put it, something's dreadfully wrong. If it's impossible to evaluate one culture against another culture, then you can't say they're equal either. Because saying they're equal is an evaluation. Not only can't you say one culture is better than another culture, but you can't say they're equal either. Equal means of equal value. You can't, say, can't say they're of equal value unless you can evaluate the two cultures one against another. So really what you ought to say is, we can't evaluate from one culture to another culture, so we can't evaluate from one culture to another culture. It wasn't a big surprise, since the conclusion is identical to the premise. And the conclusion ought to be, there's no particular attitude about one culture versus another culture that you can either justify or criticize. So I have a strong preference for culture A over culture B. No one can criticize that. If I decide to promote culture A over culture B, no one can criticize that. He can't say we know cultures are all equal, so you're violating their equality. He doesn't know that because his premise is we can't evaluate one culture against another at all. So he can't know they're equal. Somehow, I don't think that was the goal of the political left when they want to promote the equality of cultures to end up with a conclusion that they aren't really equal, there's nothing to say about the comparative value because you can't evaluate one against the other. And you can't therefore defend or criticize any attitude, even an attitude which says, this culture is the one I committed to and all the rest could drop dead. You can't, you can't, you can't criticize that. Because there's no way of saying anything about 
comparative value between cultures, even to say that they're equal. Somehow, I don't think those who use this argument are anticipating that that's the outcome. I think, in logic, that is the outcome. OK, but let's go back to the premise. Now we come to something that's a little more deep and a little more important, I think. You can't evaluate one culture against another. Because the standards of evaluation are coming from your culture. Applying your standards to another culture simply is apples and oranges. Now, I have a suggestion to make based on decades of sometimes very frustrating experience. When you're talking philosophy after the third martini, and everything is very fuzzy and very abstract and very beautiful and, and, and earth-shattering and universe-shattering, Try to take what you're discussing and apply it to everyday, common experiences. Going to the supermarket and buying, buying milk, renting a car, planting a garden, planting potatoes, uh, tomatoes in your garden in the backyard, you know, looking up Google Maps to find an address. Something everyday, common, familiar, you feel you understand it, you're in charge of it. Take these grand abstract ideas and apply it to something common and easy and see how it applies. I can predict, if you do that consistently, you'll experience a number of surprises. Sometimes you'll find you can't apply the ideas at all. They just don't apply. They don't give any obvious result or insight, which should be taken as an indication that the ideas aren't well understood altogether. And sometimes you get results that are really quite different from what you expected. Let's try it in this case. There's no way to evaluate one culture from another because the tools you're going to use belong to one culture, apply to another culture, it's apples and oranges. OK, let me describe to you a number of possibilities, a number of scenarios, and see what you think. I'm visiting a South Sea island with its own indigenous culture, quite different from mine. And I notice that when they build houses, this is what they do. They do it collectively, which some people do even in America. The Amish do it that way. They all get together, and they build the house together. They put up the walls and the roof, and then they pave the floor. Now, they have paving stones. They have a quarry with paving stones. They're all the same size. And when they come to pave the floor, here's what they do. They send a bunch of guys down to get paving stones. They all come up dragging paving stones, put them on the floor. If there aren't enough, they send another bunch down. And if there are too many, then they finish paving the floor, and they take the rest of them back. That's what they do. Well, when nobody's looking, I take out my ruler, and I measure them. And I notice that they are one foot by one foot. And the next house that they build, when nobody's looking, I measure the walls. It's a rectangle, and it's six feet by eight feet. So when they come to get the paving stones, I count out to myself 24 guys, and I say to the group, I'm going to show you a trick. Watch this. You guys go down and get paving stones. Each of you bring back one stone in, e in, in, in each hand. Okay? They go down, they come back, they pave the floor, and it fits exactly. They don't have too few stones. They don't have too many stones. They have exactly the right number of stones. Because twice 24 is 48, 6 times 8 is 48, 48 square feet. And so, could this happen? Is this a possible scenario? Right. OK, but I used geometry. Geometry was produced by Greece. It's a Western cultural product. Can geometry apply on a South Sea island in a different culture? Isn't it using apples and oranges? Using a Western cultural product to judge, evaluate, and guide an activity in another culture? Shouldn't it just fail, misfire? But of course, it won't fail, and it won't misfire. It'll do just fine. OK, another example. I'm there in the South Sea Island, and the native doubles over in pain and clutches the left, lower part of his abdomen. And I think, I got a clue. I think I know what this is. I take out my uh, super microscope, without which I, I never travel, fluoroscope. You know, and I inspect the insides of his body, and lo and behold, ruptured appendix. I take out my surgery kit, without which I never travel, my anesthesia. You know, and I do an appendectomy. And I take it out, and he you know, recovers and goes on with life. Could that happen? Is that a possible scenario? 
any hidden contradiction in what I said? Certainly not. But look, the x-ray machine was made in Paris, and the scalpels were created in England, and I went to medical school in Chicago. It's all Western stuff. It's all Western culture. How could it apply in the South Sea Island? But clearly it could. Clearly it works fine. So what about Western and Eastern, and, and, and it's apples and oranges, and it's one culture against another culture? In math, it's not going to be a problem. In physical science and medicine, it's not going to be a problem. Let's try another one. This uh, society on the South Sea Island is desperately poor. Desperately poor. They just managed to survive. I stay with them for a while, like an anthropologist, and I observe their lives. And I notice that each person or each family does everything for itself, except build houses. Each one raises its own food, and each one sews its own clothes, and each one creates its own weapons, and each one provides uh, firewood for the winters where they keep themselves warm. Each one does everything for itself. I think to myself, you know why they're dreadfully poor? Because they haven't discovered division of labor. If you have some people raising food, some people making clothes, some people making weapons, they'll get good at it, and they'll be much more productive, and the society will be more wealthy. So I explain this to them. Now, listen, you're all pretty good at raising food. This group, 25%, just raise food, study it, compare with one another, do it collectively. Just this group make clothes. Just this group make weapons, and so forth and so on. Is their standard of living going to improve? You bet it's going to improve. But division of labor was invented in the West. It's from another culture, a different cultural product. How can you apply it in the South Sea Islands? But there's no difficulty in doing that. So the idea that you can't use the standards, techniques, ideas, theories of one culture to judge, evaluate, teach, and improve another culture is simply wrong. It's simply wrong. Let me give you some other simple examples. There are international chess tournaments. International chess tournaments. Now let's suppose you got a guy who grew up in St. Louis and he's playing somebody who grew up in Tashkent or in Nigeria or in Japan. How could they possibly play chess at the same board? He moves his rook. How does he know what the other guy's going to do? Maybe the other guy's going to turn, the, th turn the, the board upside down or shoot him or go and eat a sandwich. Or who knows? He's from another culture. How can I predict what someone from another culture is going to do? But somehow these tournaments go fine. They go fine. In New York City, you have, I don't know, at least a dozen different cultures. Now you have cars on the highway. Millions of cars on the highway. The highway ought to be mayhem. It ought to be berserk. I'm taking a right turn. What's he going to do? He's from Senegal. Is he going to follow me? Go to the other lane? You know, shoot me with a, with a, with a bullet? How do I know what he's going to do? Somehow they all drive to work and they all drive to, to the ball game and they all drive home and they all manage. They all manage. Even though from, they're from different cultures. You have international agreements. Okay, not with everybody. We who live in this area of the world would recommend some, some, some exceptions to that. But you have the United States and you have India and you have China and you have uh, South Africa. And they sign international agreements. They more or less agree on what the conditions are. They agree when it's been fulfilled or when it's been violated. How is that possible if they come from different cultures? And yet they do manage. Now let me tell you, tell you a Hindu proverb. I had a boy here once who, a Shiva boy, got involved in Hinduism and he was very enamored. He thought it was very wise. So he came here, came here to argue with me. And he said, the Hindus have a wonderful proverb. Four men went into a cave, a deep, dark, winding cave to a place where no light penetrates. So they were proceeding by, by feel. One felt a large, solid pillar. Another felt a long, thin rope. Another felt a hose with a hole in the end. Another felt a big, flapping thing, sort of like paddle or some, some, some big flapping thing, wing or something. They came out and they compared notes. I felt a pillar. 
I felt a rope, I felt a hose, and I felt a flap. Of course, they were all feeling different parts of an elephant. First one was feeling the leg of the elephant, like a pillar. Second one was feeling the tail. Third one was feeling the trunk. And the fourth was feeling the ear, right? And the point of the parable is, that's how we are locked into the world. You see a, ho ro a rope, and you see a hose, and you see a flap, and you see a pole, and that's it. That's how we're locked into our own perceptions. Okay, I said to the students, let me ask you a question. After they came out of the cave, and they compared notes, did anybody suggest, let's go back into the cave. This time, let's go on a rope that goes around each of our waists, tying, connecting us together. And when one of us feels a pole, he'll jerk on the rope and pull us over so we can feel the pole also. When the other guy feels a flap, he'll jerk on the rope and pull us over and we'll all feel the flap. What about sharing the perceptions, making the perceptions available equally to all? Did they discuss that option? in this piece of Hindu wisdom? Did they consider it? Did they consider its implications? So he had to admit that they had not. Well, then it's a very superficial model. It's a picture of people who are so utterly primitive they can't imagine cooperative activity. But that's not the real world. In the real world, people travel, and they learn from what other people do, and they can evaluate what other people do vis-a-vis -vis what they do, and they can learn, and they can make progress. And by the way, I don't want it to imply that all the progress is the West exporting its great wisdom. I lived through the 60s and 70s where many people made pilgrimages to the East, in particular to learn meditation, and came back to the West and explained and taught techniques of meditation, which actually benefited a certain number of people. Nobody said, but meditation was created in India and in Thailand. It means it's a Far Eastern cultural product. You can't apply it in New York and Chicago and Los Angeles. No, they did apply it in New York and Chicago and Los Angeles. Going there and seeing what they had and seeing its effects and knowing we didn't have anything comparable meant it was worthwhile to bring it back. Acupuncture, which is good for some things and not for others. It's been tested for some things and not for others. But it does have definitely some medicinal effects. That was invented in China. We didn't have a clue about it until we learned it from the Chinese. And now, it is being used in the West also. So are we really locked up in our cultures and seeing things only from our cultures and can't use what's in one culture to evaluate another culture? There's absolutely no reason to say that. Absolutely no reason to say that. Indeed, in many cultures, I would say all, but if you want to say this, they're different in this respect, I won't resist you. In many cultures, you have two different kinds of cultural products. You have cultural products that are idiosyncratic, games. Not everyone is expected to play badminton, or chess, or, or bridge. The idea of games is that people have different tastes, and you try to develop games that will appeal to wide numbers of people. And the variety of games is considered to be a very positive thing. And it's based on people's subjectivity and difference. Some cultural products are designed for the variety of the subjective of the people in the population. Some cultural products are designed to understand the world. That's their purpose. Their purpose is to understand the world as a whole. So the purpose is to get beyond the subjectivity of the individual. When two people disagree about a product, a project like, a product like that, that has to be settled. Because the point of it is to get something which everyone can share equally. Who's to say that that project must flop. It must flop. Because it's impossible to have something that works for everybody. Math works for everybody. Medicine works for everybody. Division of labor works. You might have a culture whose religion or whose psychology made it impossible for them. You might have a culture of cripples also. But it certainly can work on very different cultures from ours. The fact that the other culture is different doesn't mean division of labor can't help them. So the general proposition that we're locked into our own culture, we can't understand one another, we can't see the world in common, and uh, we can't have cross-cultural evaluations is simply, as a general pr principle, is simply, I think, hopeless. It's hopeless. Questions up to here. OK, now, the, the standard fallback position is, 
okay, okay, right, Rabbi, but you're talking about facts. You're talking about facts. Math is a fact. Medicine is a fact. Community labor is an economic fact. What we really want to talk about is values. What's right and wrong? What's good and evil? What's just and unjust? That's what we want to talk about. And there, different cultures have different conceptions, different applications, different rules, different principles. And there's nothing you can do to bridge that. And you certainly can't export your own because that's just prejudicial. <coughs> different cultures judge human's life in different ways. And there, indeed, you are locked in your own culture. And each culture sees the world in its own way. And there's nothing, nothing so that could be used for a cross-cultural evaluation because you're going to take the values from your culture. And that culture has its own equal authority to use its own values. I think that's a mistake. Everything I've said up until now is <coughs> common coin. In, in philosophy, everyone will agree with what I've said up until now. What I'm going to say from here on is somewhat controversial. Let me start with an introduction. What kinds of disagreements can we tolerate? I don't mean tolerate, otherwise we shoot the guy. I mean, Tolerate as realistic disagreement. It's worth saving the humpbacked whale. Yes or no? OK, people disagree about that. Global warming is really happening, or it's a, it's a made up artifact. People disagree about that. What about this? There are tables. There are tables. Tables exist. There are tables. Suppose somebody comes in and says, listen. I have something to tell you guys. I know you believe in tables. I know you have this theory, this theory or hypothesis about the world that there are tables. I disagree. I say there aren't any tables. Do me something. I find it very hard to imagine taking that seriously. There are no tables. Maybe he's joking. OK, he's not joking. Maybe he's ill. He's got some kind of. Disorder, some, some, something wrong. No, nothing wrong with him. Maybe by T-A-B-L-E-S, he means something different from what I mean. That's the move that we most often make. Somebody says something in a discussion which seems absolutely ridiculous, and you say to yourself, look, he's intelligent, he's serious, he means it. It can't be he means what the words say to me, because what he, the words say to me is ridiculous. So you stop and ask him, what do you mean when you say that? Explain it to me. I'm sure you couldn't mean what, what I hear. So that's another possibility. He doesn't mean by T-A-B-L-E-S what? T-A-B-L-E-S what I mean. Maybe he means radioactive tables, or maybe he means solid diamond tables, or maybe he means you know, tables that are 2,000 years old, or who knows what he means. But no, he's serious, and he's sane, and he's competent, and he means what I mean. I don't think we can make any sense out of that, because it's obvious that there are tables. It's obvious. So a person who's serious, who's mentally competent, and who means the same thing that I mean, can't make that mistake. He can't make that mistake. It's not possible. And therefore, I can't take it seriously. I've got to think either he's not serious, or he's not competent, or he means something different by his words. Something that's so obvious can't be the matter of a mere dispute. The word mere is in there as a scare word. It's a qualification. I'll come back to that if I have time at the end. But a mere dispute. You, and by the way, notice the prejudicial words I put in his mouth. You have a theory that there are tables. You have a hypothesis that there are tables. That's ridiculous. I have a theory about tables. Evolution is a theory. Tables are not a theory. Tables are right in front of you. I'm not gathering evidence that there are tables. I'm sitting at a table. Just to disagree about that, it's just, it's not, in, it's not, in, the, it's not in, the, in the office. Someone says, I've heard a lot about the way you do math, and I understand that you're committed to 2 plus 2 is 4. OK, that's your choice. It's a free world. For me, 2 plus 2 is 5. That's all. For you, it's 4. For me, it's 5. I suggest to you that we can't understand that. What? 
Two plus two is five. <laughs> I can't imagine how you could think that. I can't imagine a mind working that way. If you say those words, I've got to think, you're not serious, or you're not competent, or when you say two plus two is five, you mean something that I don't mean. You mean something else. Beyond that, I can't deal with you. Like Aristotle said, there's a law of non-contradiction. If you contradict yourself, you've got to give up. And Aristotle said, if you meet somebody who says, contradict myself, what's the problem? It is raining here and now, and it is not raining here and now. That's my position. Aristotle said, stop talking to him. Stop talking to him. There's nobody home. There's not <laughs> if he's willing to accept a contradiction like that, then just, you know, go play basketball or something. Leave him, leave him alone. <laughs> Don't talk to him. So, when a person simply denies something that's crashingly obvious, at that point we can't take him seriously anymore. And that's true for there being tables. That's true for math. It's also true for certain propositions in ethics. Here's one the philosophers like, which reveals the sort of vicious and, and antagonistic side of philosophers. It is wrong to torture small children for fun. Now, there are many controversies in ethics and morals, many propositions that are discussed and debated, many propositions about which people are in doubt. Uh, not that I contradict you, but I can't figure out what's right, and you can't figure out what's right. But this ain't one of them. It's wrong to torture small children for fun. There's no discussion about that. And if somebody said, oh, you think there's no discussion? Watch, I'll make one. I say it's okay to torture small children for fun. I suggest to you, we can take him as little seriously as someone who says two plus two is five, or someone who says that there are no tables. It's morally permissible to torture small children for fun? That's a clear case. That's an obvious case. To say that is just to be out of the circle. You're just not, not addressing the subject. It's a non-option. Again, as a mere disagreement. You hold this, I hold that. It's a non-disagreement. So, here's one way to start to enforce standards in morality. By saying a person who steps too far over the line tries to pre present himself as taking a moral position that's too far out of the pale, is putting himself in a position where he cannot be taken seriously, just like a person who says there are no tables, or a person who says two plus two is five. And that means if someone tells me that there's a culture that believes that it's morally permissible to torture small children for fun, I've got to reject that. Now let me show you how I reject it, using the same logic that I've been using for the last 10 minutes. Let me show you how I reject it. We'll come down hard on the idea that they don't mean we thought they meant, and then I'll bring that back to our culture and show you why that's a key move. Imagine an anthropologist, this has actually happened. He goes to visit some tribe somewhere. He's the first one to visit. There's no common language. He's got to learn their language. So they are running around doing their various things and making noises, and he's got to figure out how those noises work with what they're doing. That's a job. It's not an easy job. It's a job that can go wrong. Indeed, I'm told that the English, when they went to Australia and they tried to learn the language of the native uh, Australians, um, when uh, they heard them say kangaroo, and they saw that usually when they said kangaroo, one of those two-legged, pouched, furry things was going by, they thought kangaroo meant that two-legged, pouched, furry thing. Later they discovered that's not what it means at all. Kangaroo in Native Australia means, there it goes! And the kangaroos were going. <laughs> and they were the thing that was going. So they said, kangaroo, kangaroo! And the poor Brit said, oh, it's that animal. And all the Australian was saying is, there it goes! <laughs> they found that out after a while. So, so you're dealing with a, a culture, you're hearing them speak, you're trying to figure out what they're saying. It's a game, it's a, it's, I don't say a game, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an effort, it's a guess. It's a hypothesis. It could be right. It could be wrong. You may have to change it later. Now, there was a French-Jewish sociologist named Claude Lévi-Strauss. 
Claude Levi Strauss claimed to have discovered a group of people whom he called pre logical, a pre logical tribe. He said, I've listened to them talking, I've built up a dictionary, and I can translate what they say, and they are happy to say, it is raining now and it is not raining now, here. They're happy to say that. So you see that they just don't have any logic. They're before logic, to them, the contradiction doesn't phase them. Well, he was criticized by Willard Van Roman Quine, among other people, in the following way. Your dictionary translates them as saying something patently absurd. Maybe the problem isn't in their pre-logical minds. Maybe the problem is in your dictionary. If your dictionary translates them as saying something absolutely absurd, maybe you should condemn your dictionary. Your dictionary wasn't given at Sinai. He didn't say that, but I'm saying that. It wasn't given at Sinai. Don't guarantee your dictionary is right. One thing you do when you translate somebody is try to make sense out of him. If he looks like a normal human being, if he has a society, if he's living reasonably successfully, then he's not going to believe absurd things. So then your dictionary is wrong. This became known in linguistics as the principle of charity. The principle of charity is I'm human and he's human. He's living under conditions that we all live under. He's living, he's not dying, he's not committing suicide, he uh, has social cooperation, he fights wars, he has production. He can't be totally out of touch with reality. He can't be. Couldn't function that well if he was totally out of touch with reality. That being the case, if my dictionary translated him as saying something out of reality, then my dictionary is wrong. It's another same symptom of how I'm not going to tolerate that kind of radical disagreement. Okay, that's why when we have somebody in the same culture and he says something that seems bizarre, the first move usually is, tell me what you mean by your words. I suspect you don't mean what I mean. What you think you're saying and what I'm hearing are two different things. I want to understand you, so please explain yourself to me what you mean, because I'm not getting it. Because otherwise, he'd be saying something that's patently absurd, and I know he's a reasonably successful human being. He can't believe something that's as, as absurd as that. So, that's one way to see that there are going to be limits on possible moral disagreement. Morality can't be just a free-for-all. There can't be a society that says it's morally permissible to torture small children for fun because if you have this dictionary created by Claude Levi Strauss or somebody else, and the, and the native says, gobbledy, 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 gook, and the translator says, it is it's permissible to torture small children for fun, I'm going to say to him, you missed out uh, permissible, you missed out for fun, you missed out torture, you missed out morally, you missed out something, your dictionary is wrong. There can't be a disagreement about that and possess the same concept. Now, I want to make the same point in another way. It's the same point, but it's worth making another way because I'm fighting an uphill battle here. If you try to go back and sell this on campus, they will shoot you. I recommend that you keep the truth under your own cranium and don't try to discuss it or the liberal fascists will get behind you and, and they'll, they'll, they'll knock you down. They'll really knock you down. Um, you know, in Tennessee, a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, uh, 10 year old, one child sneezed, the other child said, bless you. And the teacher said, you cannot say that in my class. You cannot say that in my class. Teacher, and the child said, I have a constitutional right to say what I, to say that? The, the child was suspended from school. No religious talk in my class. But it's not an exaggeration. Anyway, um, let's go back to the critic. The critic says, different cultures have different ethics, different morality. In their culture, it's morally permissible to torture small children for fun. Now, I say to him, I'm going to be very chauvinistic, very imperialistic, very egotistical. You're telling me in my language what they believe. You're using my concepts to describe what they believe. You're calling it moral. You're saying to me, they believe it's morally permissible to torture small children for fun. So my words and my concepts are supposed to be describing what they're doing. Well, my concepts don't work that way. There's no such thing as morally permissible to torture small children for fun. 
For me, when the put, you put my words and my concepts together that way, you end up with zero. So you can't be describing another moral system. When you say you're describing another moral system, you're using my concept. I own it. I've defined it, and it's mine. And it doesn't work that way. My concept doesn't work that way. So it's wrong to use my concept to describe it that way. The best you could say is, well, they don't care about your concept. They don't care about your concept. They don't care about your morality. They don't care about your values. That could be. I don't think it's really possible, but from the point of view of philosophical discussion, that could be. Could very well be. It's not an alternative moral system. It's living without morality and doing something else. Maybe they pledge allegiance to the chief, and for them, everything the chief says to do must be done, and everything the chief says not to do must not be done. Fine. And they have a term in their language, Q. <clears throat> Torturing small children for fun is Q. And stealing is Q. And uh, uh, poisoning the, the, the fish is not Q. So on and so on. Maybe so. That's fine. But that doesn't make it a moral, a moral alternative. It's not a moral alternative. It's a different way to live without morality altogether. That's not a moral disagreement. It's simply we have something called morality, which is a concept and a set of rules that work in a certain way, and they don't have it. Let me just make one more remark, and then I'll take your question. Now, I don't mean to pretend that our concept is perfectly well understood or perfectly well defined. We have disagreements also. We have dis disputes about how morality should be used and applied, what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil. We do have disputes. This has nothing to do with different cultures. In Cambridge, Massachusetts, you have Harvard, you have MIT, and they have disputes about these things. They're all Americans. They all came from the same colleges. They all grew up in the same literature and the same baseball, and they have disagreements about it. But I'm not saying there are no disputes. I'm saying there are no disputes which are radical and justified by the fact that it's culture to culture. And since it's a different culture, therefore they have equal authority to say whatever they like. And in their culture, torturing small children for fun is morally permissible. That's not going to be an option. Because given that you are describing them with my word, M-O-R-A-L, what they do has to fit within the parameters of my word, M-O-R-A-L. And if it doesn't fit, then don't use my word, M-O-R-A-L. It's very uh, prejudicial, very imperialistic. I'm using my word to describe the world. But why not? Why not? My word describes something about way people, people behave. And there's no reason why I can't apply my word moral to their culture and require that anything they say in their culture is going to be translated as moral in my word, my culture, in my vocabulary, in my conceptual system, it's got to live up to my concept. Otherwise, don't use my word. So we're not going to have room for radical disagreement about moral morality going from culture to culture. There's not going to be room for that kind of disagreement. Question's up to you, yeah. Are you making a point to say that the word moral is, um, at least for us, that the word moral comes from we pledge allegiance to chief Q God, or sorry, chief God. So all of our do's and do nots make up Q, and Q is morality. No. And so yeah, you mean from, from the Jewish point of view? Yeah. No, completely not. I have a whole long thing about what, what uh, my, my Jewish and morality uh, fit one another, but no, absolutely not. There are some people who have tried that. It's called the divine command theory, but we don't, uh, we don't uh, subscribe to it. And I think philosophically, it's not a good theory to subscribe to. So how do you... Oh, it's, it's, I can't do that now. We have five more minutes. I, it's, a, it's a long, long story. Ten more minutes, yeah. So you're saying that across cultures, you cannot have a moral disagreement? No, what I'm saying is... Like there are limits to the moral disagreement. There are limits to moral disagreement everywhere within the culture and cross-culturally. It could be that another culture has a moral insight that we've overlooked. That could be. And it could be that within the limits of my concept, they found a niche that I was unaware of. And it fits well enough under the concept to be part of the same discourse, the same discussion that we are undergoing. That could happen. But that could happen for somebody in my own culture also. And indeed, it does happen within the culture. What I'm really saying is, the fact that you're going from culture to culture plays no role at all. That doesn't justify any greater disagreements or greater divergence. It doesn't make it more appropriate. Going from culture to culture plays no role in the discussion, the analysis, the 
the, uh, the, the argument just is just irrelevant. Yeah. How is it possible for a moral culture to suspend its concept of morality and gas children? How did they do this? How is it possible? Okay, this is a very good question. Um, let's ask the more the more the prior question. Did the Nazis have different morals from us? Did the Nazis have different morals from us? You're taking for granted that they did. You ask how they could suspend yes. their morality. Yeah. I'm assuming they had a moral culture, but then they... they I, think it's, I think the truth is more than that. I don't think they had different morals from us. And I'll give you my reason. You know very well that the Nazis made up a myth that Jews are evil. Jews are evil. They cheat, they steal, they poison the water. They want to take over the world. They control the media. They control the banks. Jews are evil, Jews are powerful, and they're trying to take over the world. Why did they bother to do that? Why did they bother? Why did the Nazis say, listen, Jews are clean, intelligent, hardworking, mostly honest, productive people, and we kill them anyway because we have different morals. You like people like that, you support people like that, you value people like that, and we kill them. You have your morals, we have our morals. They're moral rules. No, they didn't do that. They made up a myth that Jews are evil. Why did they do that? Because if Jews are evil and they're threatening you, then it's morally okay to protect yourself against them. What they wanted to do was appeal to the old moral values, the common moral values. By the way, European settlers in the United States, North America, did the same thing. They wanted the Indians' land. There was something called manifest destiny. We're going to go from the East Coast to the West Coast. We're going to run the whole thing. Yeah, but how can you take away other people's land? You can't do that. That's not right. You know how they solved it? They said, if you have a red skin, you're not human. You're just an, an animal. Nothing wrong with taking away land from animals. Did they have a different morality? Not at all. They kept the old morality and got around it by changing the facts. If a person has to change the facts in order to justify what he's doing, that's a symptom that he has the old morality. He hasn't changed his morality. He's kept the old morality and justifying what he's doing by changing the facts. It's not so easy to change your moral rules. not so easy to suspend morality. Whatever Nietzsche said, it's not so easy to do that. At any rate, that's why I think that there is uh, the idea that many cultures have many truths, even in morality, is not sustainable. Cultures are styles of looking at the world. They do have different um, foci. They do uncover different aspects of the world. No question about it. That's why one can learn from the other. But to say that they're locked in their own scheme and they can't communicate, can't coordinate, can't integrate, that's certainly false. We have endless examples of that. There was a time, I think that I'm getting the dates right, in the end of the 19th century, European art was stagnating, and people went to Africa and to the South Seas to see what people were doing there and got some inspiration from it. Even in music, if I remember correctly, this is all second or third hand, African music typically is just rhythm, but extremely complex rhythm, rhythm that Europe didn't have anything like. Okay, so they don't have bassoons. They don't have a double bass. They don't have a piccolo. OK, but they have rhythms. And you can learn something from that. So when you're looking for inspiration, you go to another culture and see what they have and use that as inspiration. Japanese miniature trees, they're unbelievable. You have a tree, which in our forest would be 60 feet tall, and it's 18 inches tall. It's unbelievable. And it's real. It's real. And, it, and it grows. <laughs> you know? Or Japanese rock garden sculptures. and Who knows? It's simply not true that we're locked in our culture. It's not true that cultures have their own different truths and their own different equally valid competing lifestyles. They can be better or worse. We can evaluate whether they're better or worse. They can evaluate. It's not just an accident that genes of Coca-Cola have conquered the world. And jazz does very well. And some number of years ago, there was a worldwide Shakespeare festival in China, in Japan, places in Africa. This is 
late medieval English culture. What has it got to do with contemporary Japan? Because Shakespeare wrote about human dilemmas. And the fundamentals of human dilemmas are the same everywhere. And people in Japan could appreciate Shakespeare's expression of human dilemmas. Because Shakespeare found something which is really universal. I don't say, well, it was composed in 16th century or 8th, 17th century Britain. It can't be applied anywhere else or any time else. Simply not true. The world doesn't work that way. So I don't think anybody should use the multiplicity of cultures as an excuse to say there are incommensurable values or there are different points of view that can't be reconciled, that can't be understood. It simply isn't true. Okay? All right. <clears throat>